Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Kate Conklin. Thank you all so much for joining us. I have in her own words that Kate Conklin is six foot three inches of pure unadulterated resonance. Yes, she is. Um, she is an operatic soprano, a leading interpreter of the highly demanding vocal music of Bulgaria and an extraordinary performance coach. After earning two degrees in vocal performance, she was awarded a Fulbright and studied singing and conducting in Bulgaria, where she performed for a professional with a professional women's choir. She was then the vocalist for Cirque du Soleil's O, where she performed approximately 900 shows and was then brought on to teach at the California Institute of the Arts for several years before founding her own training for performers. And this um, this talk is now uh, benefiting the Center for the Advancement of Body Literacy, which is Pamela's. So if Pamela would like to discuss what that is for us all. Can you sure. The yeah. Center for the Cable, Center for the Advancement of Body Literacy, is a 501c3 that was founded <laughs> last year um, with some very amazing people. Please don't do that. Um, and our mission is to provide accessible, excellent, inclusive body literacy and sex education information across uh, across a lot of different platforms and also to examine the issues surrounding uh, bodily autonomy, specifically in the United States, but also worldwide, um, where it impacts contraception. So we're we're uh, we're on a, a a very intense body autonomy mission. All right, and then Kate, would you like to tell us where we're here? Why are we here? What is wildness and precision? Well, we are actually here because of Laura and Pamela <laughs> and their brilliant, brilliant, irresistible concept that I literally threw my body. <laughs> so thank you for this Yay. opportunity. I'm so excited. And so we're gonna talk today about wildness and precision uh, which is the, the name that I have given my method, but we're actually going to talk about why. What does that mean? And so, as, as Laura mentioned, I'm Kate Conklin. Um, I am 6'3", used to be 6'2", until very recently. Got a little extra bonus growth there somewhere in the mid-40s. And I do, in fact, coach the best performers in the world to perform even better than they've ever imagined. And that is the key of wildness and precision, is how do we tap into the creativity that is possible to us because we are biological beings in a creative universe. So that's where we're going today. I'm gonna to give you some really specific examples, uh, but I need to get a few things in place first. The first thing is a hallmark of all biological life is that it is inherently creative. Biological life is designed to reach out into new territories, to forge new paths. We make stuff, we make art because it is in our DNA. It is our design to make stuff. So let's just get that <laughs> established. <laughs> when you have those urges, there, that's not just a like, oh, I wonder where that's coming from. That is in your cells. It is in all cells. And I became aware of this around the age of 15 or 16 when I discovered the work of Fritjof Capra, who wrote the Tao of Physics and um, a, no, many, many other things. <laughs> Cora saying true, true, yes. <laughs> so when I came across that work, I didn't necessarily know it at the time, but everything changed because everything that I had understood about myself as a human, as a singing creature, suddenly made so much sense according to science. And that really put me on a path of everything being cross-pollinated and systems and webs of relationships. So I call my work wildness and precision because that's what I think best describes what I make, the art I make, the art I most love, the performance qualities that I coach people in, 
And, and this is what we're going to dive deeper into today is the performance, uh, sorry, the process itself, the coaching process, the performance process itself is always an infinity loop of wildness and precision. So what do I mean by wildness? I mean, the unrestrained, spontaneous, native to oneself in transcendent performance, there is an immediacy, a, a deeply playful, limitlessness seeming quality to what's going on. Precision is what you think it is. It's the quality of accuracy, congruency, doing the thing you intend to do reliably and whenever possible, exquisitely, right? So not just executing accurately, but also like with style, <laughs> if that is what you choose to do. <laughs> I always think of um, like the 70s skateboarders you know, that, that really went from being like, we're doing the thing to we're doing the thing, but we also have like attitude and we're doing all kinds of, you know, there's like style that came in. And that's what you always get. When we develop mastery, we get more availability for creativity, for play. So another key concept I want to put in place here, because it's going to come up a bunch, is the concept of emergence. Emergence meaning the arising of coherence from simple parts, things being more than the sum of their parts. A simple uh, example of this is a starling murmuration. You know, if you see those groups of <laughs> starlings that sort of morph and amoeba and shapeshift, no one's in charge, you know, no one's calling the next choreo. That is an emergent process that's finding itself over and over and over again. Another way of putting this is um, getting at something that is more complex than can be explained from the sum of the parts. And one other phrase I like to use here is we're talking about ensuance rather than pursuance. So you can, of course, pursue something. I want this exact thing. But mostly what we're going to be talking about is ensuance what arises because the conditions are there for whatever is possible. So in the case of my work, both as an artist and as a coach, it's a matter of learning how to reliably create the conditions for things like optimal acoustics, optimal movement, so that those things can emerge without a lot of pursuance, without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, with, without a lot of effort so that what we actually want, what we value, what we think sounds amazing or looks amazing or, you know, is a new thing that's never been done before, can actually be revealed on its own as a consequence of loosening the current organization so that a new organization can emerge. That said, of course, we know that we can do this, so when we want something precise, when we want something very specific, we're absolutely using these processes to call in exactly what we want, right? So again, it's that infinity loop of like, I want to be able to float this pianissimi, pianissimo gossamer spider web note exactly like this for exactly this duration with exactly this amplitude. And I also know the most precise way for me to do that is to create the conditions where that can happen and self-perpetuate on its own. So it's, in a sense, the easiest, most straight shot to be able to do what you want all the time. But it's a little bit different than what often we have learned in, let's face it, a rather Cartesian, you know, paradigm. <laughs> so that said, it's very different, that sort of precision arising is very different than sort of a brute force or controlling. So here's the metaphor I want to use. So I was out on the beach earlier and it was just so perfect because I had been thinking about like, there are so many metaphors. <laughs> How can one choose? But this is the one that wants to be heard today because it just kept coming up. So I was out on the beach and I, it's a great day, clearly, because there's like tons of people out surfing beautifully, just these beautiful rides. And of course, all of the pelicans are going along just drafting off the waves, not, you know, <laughs> knocking people off their surfboards is very funny. Pelicans seem not to be bothered by surfers. And the wildness, right, in that is like 
the wind, the waves, the weather, the tides, all of those natural elements that have their own organization and energy. And then the precision is how we collaborate with them in a skilled way so that we can ride the wave. Because the waves don't really care about us, right? The waves are just doing what they do. But when we can merge with them, collaborate with them through our own skills and coordination, amazing, wonderful things can be had. So our skills, and really key here, our adaptability, along with our intention, are all dancing together with nature all the time. Surfing is an amazing example of this. It's everywhere, right? It's in martial arts, it's in painting, it's in singing, it's in dancing, it's everywhere. So we can ask for what we want, but we cannot control every factor, which is actually the blissful part of it, is that we are in creation with nature, with everything else. We are not controlling something. We are dancing with it. We are in collaboration with the creative force of life, the universe and everything. So you can get really good at surfing, but you're always in that conversation with the waves and ultimately they do what they do and we respond how we can. So this is sort of the precision bit now coming in is like, you do your bit. You wax your board, you do all the stuff, you have your skills, you have good equipment, right? You know how to put your booties on so you don't, I don't know, bad things don't happen. So again, wildness and precision are in this infinite loop. It, loop. It's always both and. So I want to talk you through my, my process for how I actually coach performers on this. And then I'm going to give you a really concrete example. So what I love about this, I can just fractal off and spiral off forever about this, but I will keep it, <laughs> keep it somewhat contained. When I was thinking about, well, okay, so how do I actually coach performers? What, what do we actually do? What do I do with people over and over again that coaxes out their best work beyond what they've even imagined they can have, beyond what they've been able to ask for? Because ultimately, if you're at the leading edge of your craft, of your art, you're going to be going into territory that's not only unknown for other people, it's unknown for you. And if you can't imagine it, then you don't know how to ask for it which means we need processes that will reveal what's possible before we've experienced it yet. So we don't have a reference. <laughs> we do a lot of inventing in this work. And what was so cool about this is I was thinking, well, yeah, what do I do? How do we get the results that we get? And so the very process of putting together the four pillars of my wildness and precision method was an emergent process. I did not sit down and go, all right, I need, I need some rules. <laughs> it was, I don't need rules because ultimately rules are not laws of nature. And back to 15, 16 year old Kate, who was like, well, we kind of, when we, we know a, a fair amount about how the webs of relationships work, about how systems work, about how biological life works. So how does this actually apply to spinning through the air? to, you know, singing an amazing high note over and over again, whatever. So this process of, okay, so what's actually needed and what do I find myself doing over and over again with performers? That is how I got here. So here are the four pillars. See where this lands in your own discipline, in your own art. It's interesting. Always, I think, to go through these things with an eye toward how does this apply to me and what are the gold nuggets here? So there may be something, you know, a little perspective in here that you're like, oh, that's totally what I do. I want to bring that into my understanding or, or I want to add it. Cheers. Okay. So the first pillar is optimal coordination. Optimal coordination means cooperating with the design of your body, with the design of your art form and the design of the world, right? So reality, <laughs> physics, laws of nature, things like that. And so this, when I'm coaching people, has to do with using your voice and your body expertly so that you are really fluent in yourself, in what does what, in 
how your voice responds to certain things, and then of course creating optimal acoustic and movement qualities. And this is immediate. This first step is the first thing I do with people because you always have lots of skills and abilities, whether or not you're fully accessing them all the time on purpose, that's what this step is about. It's just putting you right in the center of like, this is what I already know how to do, giving you access to it really fast. The second pillar is skill mastery. So this is where we identify what further skill you might need to be able to do what you want to do. And also to find ways to work at the leading edge of what you can currently do so that you can continue to refine, become more precise and become, and this is very important to me, more elegant, simpler, more direct, if that's what you want. So this is skill building, refinement, technical work. This sometimes means streamlining processes that just you don't need all the steps anymore, um, don't reflect your current needs or desires, that kind of stuff. The third pillar is performance practices, experiments, rehearsal variations, and this is where we work with things like text and character and biopsychosocial history, um, communing with future audience and what kinds of references they might have and what they might be coming to the performance for. So this is really about opening all of our antennae to everything that is available to us so that we can connect, communicate with ourselves, our ensemble, and the audience. This is all about opening pathways, opening doorways to conveying what you want to convey, which ultimately, I believe, always comes down to some flavor of truth. And then of course, finding the resonance between you and your character, between you and the text, between you and the aerial silk. How, how do I blend with this? How do I loosen my own organization enough that I can really merge in a meaningful way with my apparatus, with my ensemble, with my audience, with the acoustics of the room that I'm in? That gets really trippy and really fun. The last pillar is extraordinary performance coaching, and this is all about collaboration. This is where we get really wild with using different kinds of stimuli, trying different approaches, and then working in quick little feedback loops so that we can find out not only what matters to the activity, but what matters to you. What do you care about? Why are you here doing this? What are your favorite things, right? There are certain things that I absolutely love that if I get like a beautiful rolled R, I'm just like, I feel so happy, right? There, that's where we get into like, what are the things that make you so happy, that light you up, that make you go, oh, I'm here, <laughs> I'm alive. <laughs> so with that, because it's so useful and necessary, I also use some unwinding of subconscious patterns work and some energy work. And the only reason I do that is because it makes things faster and more elegant. So. Those are the four pillars of wildness and precision. Optimal coordination, skill mastery, performance practices, rehearsal variations, and extraordinary performance coaching. What kinds of training that you've found in singing? I'm gonna come back to that question, Laura. Okay, so, oh wow, Pamela, amazing. <laughs> this way of working trans, both transcends and unites disciplines. So I call this work transdisciplinary because the process of creativity and mastery is its own flow. It is its own discipline. And how I got my start in this was really looking at, okay, how do I do what I want to do? Well, I want to be able to sing anything that I want to anytime. And I don't even know what those are yet. There's so many ways of singing that I'm sure I haven't heard of that I'm going to want to be able to do. How do I prime my instrument? so that I can do that. That is also what I discovered working in Cirque du Soleil and watching the best performers in the world, the best acrobats, the best high divers, et cetera, et cetera, is, you know, these weren't people who were doing one act and that's it. The acrobats were the high divers, were the characters, were the, you know, they were doing multiple things. And so I got to see what is the connective tissue here? What do all highly skilled, highly coordinated performance or activities 
have in common. And that's really the heart of my work. So that's a bit about that. Now we're going to get down to brass tacks. Now we're going to do some singing. Let's talk about singing. And the reason I'm going to talk about singing is because it's the easiest thing for me to demonstrate right now. If I had someone here with a steer wheel, you know, I would do that. <laughs> but it's me. So I have um, an example. So I sing in more than 17 languages and I coach artists in every discipline. So I've really put this to test <laughs> because it's very important to me. My, my heart and soul is I love, 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 love artists. I freaking love us. Seriously. And I think we deserve every good thing because I think we're here to evolve the species and the planet. <laughs> Family, you're <laughs> just reading pamphlets. <laughs> yes, because you never know. I just had a whole thing where I'm like, I think I'm, I think I'm good with Greek songs. And then I heard another Greek song and I was like, into the rabbit hole I go. I'm not here to say some song or some piece of music can't find its way to me because I don't speak the language. It's like, well, then fucking speak, figure it out, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, you know, the music finds me, um, which is what happened with Bulgarian music. And so that's, that's the example I'm going to give you. But I want to say, like, we test, test, test this stuff. I call it the hottest fire. Does it work in every situation? Because if it doesn't, we really need to know that. Right? I'm not going to go up to some world-class acrobat and be like, I can help you be better at that, you know, and then have nothing to back it up. It's like, you got to test that stuff, right? So I'm in year, well, let's see, 20-ish of doing this with people. So we've done a lot of stuff in that time. There was a whole era where I was working with a ton of aerialists. There was a whole era where I was working with a bunch of women in their 50s and 60s who had vocal wobble, which is actually very easy to fix. So they're all off, happy, singing away. Um, but, you know, I had a whole era where people were coming to me for running. A lot of plantar fasciitis, a lot of foot stuff. You know, it's just like, it's, again, it's like the emergence of like, oh, this is in the field. Everybody needs help with their feet. Okay, here we go. This is what we're doing for a while. So let's dive into Thracian Bulgarian singing. So there are different regions of Bulgaria and they all have their own distinct styles, idioms, you know, that sort of thing. In Thracian Bulgarian singing, there is what I'm gonna call a pulsation. It's not vibrato, it's not the same thing as vibrato. It's a pulsation that sort of cascades into ornamentation. When I heard this, I just, my head filled with bubbles and it was over. I was just, <laughs> you know, so, This is one of those times when I was like, okay, I can't even really hear what's happening. I can just, I can feel it, but I can't really analyze it. I can't break it apart because it's so fluid. It's like water running over rocks. It's like, how do you break that down? I don't know, right? And so I did learn to do it and I'm gonna teach you, or I'm gonna show you what this process is like. This is a perfect microcosm of wildness and precision. So we have something like Does everybody hear that okay? I didn't break anyone's speakers. I have my original sound on, I think. Every once in a while I think I'm making noise and it's just going quiet. Good? Okay. Someone will tell me if yeah. <laughs> well I am obsessed with it, so yeah. Um, okay, so what we have here is a pulsation cascading into a little ornamentation. So what does that mean? We need a mobile waveform, so handy since sound moves in waves. Uh -huh. Something to notice. Mobile waveform with some particulars, right? We have some pitch variation. There's some specific timing. There's relationship. And then there's like the melody, the ornamentations, the, the end of the phrase, etc. And we need super long phrases with pretty much no place to breathe that end on a dime. <laughs> One of my Bulgarian teachers used to say, well, anyone can start well. <laughs> Which was her way of saying, I'm listening to the way y'all are ending your phrases and you sound tired. <laughs> so 
We want all of that. We want it all, right? Because that is actually the truest expression of that art form. And if you want to vary something, great, vary it. But I never want to vary something because I can't do it. I want to learn how to do it and then vary, you know, artistically, if I possibly can. So we need a lot of precision, but we also need that waveform. So you kind of see where I'm going with this. We can, and this is what often people do, we can just try to do the thing. Just approximate what we hear. And if that works for you, great. <laughs> you know, for me, when I hear I just, when I heard that, I was like, what? <laughs> so I needed some more detail. So we can just, again, have a go at it. And if it comes out well, then great. But let's say we want to get like masterful at this. So then we can loosen it up a bit and kind of explore the movement. Find how it's, you know, maybe a little wild, but interesting. So what happens if I kind of play with that, right? So it, like what happens to the resonance? What happens to the overtones? When we increase the airflow, we play with the mobility. Okay, so for me, that's starting to get a little more distinctive and I feel like I'm slowing down time and I can kind of play with the waveform more. So that's interesting. Then, what if I take that gesture, that, that pulsation, and I kind of distill the movement? What am I actually doing? I'm basically going yeah 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 with the back of my tongue. Yeah 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 yeah. And I also know that this is one way to do ululation. Yeah! Right? You get this. So remember now, energy follows play, right? So I'm making myself laugh. I'm going publicly, right? But here's the thing, that's actually what this singing is. So if I go Okay, it's a little wild, it's a little messy, but you can see how it's kind of helping me understand the gesture. So, let's just take a moment, sidebar, and let's consider the design of our vocal instrument. What do we know about the vocal mechanism that might be useful while we're playing with this movement? Oh, well, there is this really cool thing called the hyoid bone. Hyoid bone is a little U-shaped bone in your throat. It's at the base of your tongue, at the top of your larynx. And it doesn't have any other bony attachments. When it is uh, developing in fetuses, it just kind of shows up. <laughs> Hello, I'm here, which is so cool. And it has no other bony attachments, which is, I think, unique in the human body. I think it's the only bone that has no other bony attachments. That said, it has 14 muscular attachments. Ooh, interesting. Hmm. 14 muscular attachments. That's a lot of play. So when you jiggle the base of your tongue, which is attached to the hyoid bone, which is attached to your larynx, all of which is attached to your resonator tube, you get this nice kind of jiggly, sloshy thing going through the whole resonator tube because the 14 attachments go everywhere from your jaw to your sternum to, wait for it, your scapula, <laughs> your omohyoid goes, this is a muscle that goes from your hyoid bone, so in your throat, down your neck, underneath your clavicle, changes directions. Oh, who saw that coming? Reverses directions, goes back, and attaches to the spine of your scapula. So the bone in your throat has a muscular attachment to your shoulder blade. So for singers, yes, you have to care about your whole body. <laughs> there are muscular attachments from your throat to your back. So very important. So when you do this jiggle, you basically get this, right? Pretty wild, but there's some order to it. 
you, this is what your throat's kind of doing. It's sort of like belly dancing, right? When you learn belly dancing, one of the things that you start to learn is that we're not actually trying to jiggle soft tissue as much as we're moving bony structures and the things that are attached to it jiggle because it's attached. <laughs> Same thing with Thracian singing. Okay, so we've got the yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. That's kind of starting to self perpetuate a little bit there. But wait a minute. Sidebar. This style of singing is from Thrace or Trachea. What do we know about Trachea? Trachea is a plateau. It's in the middle of the country, middle kind of south. It's pretty flat. Which means something that is a wave is going to be carried better. It's going to make it easier to hear. So like vibrato in classical styles, that waveform combined with a little pitch variation will go further over longer distances of flat land and you'll be able to hear it more distinctly. Contrast that with say the Shok region of Bulgaria, which is mountainous and is characterized by yips and yodels which reverberate all over those nice rocky surfaces. So interesting to note how there is a adaptive quality to this, which is not to say that everything needs to be adaptive. We already talked about that. It's not how biology works. We reach out into new territory because we just do. <laughs> not because everything has to be a good adaptation. But it's interesting to note, yeah, this this would be messier if you sang it in the mountains, whereas if you sing it over a plane, it has like room to spread out and really be heard. So you see here, we're interfacing with the design of the vocal mechanism, the design of the music, the design of the terrain. All of this is dancing together and inviting all of this to be part of what I'm doing so that I can become a better conduit for their fullest expression. And this is what I mean when I say better than I imagine. I want to perform better than I even imagine possible because I'm not imagining a specific outcome right now. I'm just playing with the processes. I'm joining with the dance and seeing what happens. Now I'm going to play with some air pressure and velocity because we haven't really talked about that very much. After all, singing is flight. All wind instruments are flight. We're talking about quite literally aerodynamics. So I'm gonna get my jiggle going aye, 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 and play with a little bit of a, you know, freer airflow, a little wildness in my airflow. So now we're starting to get a sort of oscillation that is free enough that it can reorganize and self-perpetuate. Starts to happen on its own. So what I feel in my throat is almost nothing. I just kind of feel like I'm breathing out and things are a little sloshy. So then based on that, got this going really nicely. It's kind of supporting me now, right? Kind of like surfing. Now that I've got that, I can start doing tricks. I can start making creative decisions based on my ideas, my preferences, my instincts, right? So, So another facet of the precision is how I end that phonation, how I end that phrase precisely with a release of the glottis, opening the airway, which is the fastest way to breathe and stop sound at the same time, because you're just catching the recoil of the respiratory mechanism. And then the sound can end with vibration rather than dampening, right? So if I go, uh, hang on, I gotta, yeah. <laughs> You hear that little hold, it's going to shrink those overtones. Just like if you hit a gong and then you put your hand on it. Now, if I let my glottis drop open, it's going to allow those overtones to ring. And those overtones are the thing 
that makes Bulgarian singing so distinctive and gives us those famous bone-rattling sonorities of the Bulgarian women's choir. Precise resonance, the emphasis of upper partials, which is best done with freedom of the mechanism and a specific ask. So in addition to letting my airway fall open in order to stop the sound, in order to breathe again, I can also use my hard palate, the bony surface of my hard palate, just think of that as an inner mountain, <laughs> to bounce the sound off of. Ta -da! So there you go. So all of that means now my long phrases and my nowhere to breathe issue becomes the means by which the art gets even more brilliant. So our pulsation now has super potentiated par particles, particles, <laughs> partials, <laughs> and you essentially get the sonic equivalent, the acoustic representation of the Aurora Borealis. That's what I'm going for. If you said to me, what do you want this to be like? I'd say, I kind of want it to sound like the Aurora Borealis looks. But I didn't start with that specific ask, although that's kind of what it sounds like to me, this music. <laughs> I went, okay, how do I see what this is all about and what business we have together, right? So is this precision? Yes. Is it wildness? Yeah. I've used the design of my body, the art form, the optimal coordination, optimal acoustic to make art better than I imagine. So it's not only efficient and sustainable, but it's actually energizing because I am truly surfing the airflow, which is air prana, which is life force. My job now is to just traffic in life force and make cool noises with it. And this is why the best Bulgarian singers look like they're doing nothing, don't get tired, can do it for hours and hours and hours, and can do it into their 80s. So all of that said, <laughs> what you find when you're working in this way is it will be upward spiral the whole time. Even, <laughs> Even when things get messy temporarily, knowing this is how emergence works, this is how acoustics work, this is actually how we get those specific singers form at partials that make the sound carry in the opera house, that make the sound carry across the Thracian plain. How I get that is by asking to do what my body is designed to do, be creative, be wild, see what I have access to. Because as long as I'm being tight or forced or brutal with myself, it's always gonna be limiting. Limiting in mobility, limiting in airflow, limiting in acoustics, limiting in creativity, in what I can actually call forth and what can come through. And the more available I am, the more I make a process of becoming available and responsive the more access I have to not only my own creativity, but all of the creativity in the universe. So I'm going to pause there. <laughs> I do have another example. I don't know how we're doing on time. We are, oh, let's see. Should we take questions? Should we go to questions? Pamela, tell me what to do. <laughs> do you want to try another sample? I mean, that's fine. We could do that unless lots of people have other questions. Do people have questions? Tell me in the chat. I mean, I'd be happy to have a conversation, but I'm deeply enjoying what you're doing. So if there's more. <laughs> yeah, we'll I, I, want to, I want to hear more. Come on. Get both. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quickie. I'll give you a quickie. This is one of those situations where this applies to anything that you do that needs to be fast or precise. Could be fast, could also just be very, very, very specific. Uh, could be applied to footwork, to playing the speed bag, uh, to playing road, anything fast and florid or very detailed. So I was singing in the shower one day. But again, this is just an example of wildness and precision in practice. There's a reason I chose those words. It's just what I do all the time. It's like make messes and see how they become art. <laughs> 
So I was singing in the shower and I was playing with um, this little four note thing. <laughs> That's not a four note thing. <laughs> it's kind of a four note thing. Da -da 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 -da. That's what I was doing. And I was going faster and faster with his little vocal ease. And I was playing with this kind of getting sloshy, everything uh, moving and swinging, because the larynx is in a swing of muscles, you know, so that you can go upside down and still breathe. Yay! But also very mobile, very swingy, so that you can make cool art with it. Double yay! So I realized at some point while I was singing this, I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going too fast and now I'm just slurring. Like there's no distinctive notes happening. And it cracked me up because it just was like, you know, I just thought it was a mess. And it gave me a funny feeling, so I kept going. But fully knowing like, okay, you're not doing the thing anymore. You're not doing distinctive notes. You're just kind of slurring through things but it's hilarious. And it kept getting wilder and wilder until something really interesting happened, which is my ears caught up with what my voice was doing. What was actually happening was that my voice was going faster than I could perceive the notes. So once my ears caught up, I could actually hear that I was singing precise pitches, but it was very, very fast, and my ears took a second to catch up. So uh, an, an analogy for this is like, when you do something precise very, very fast, it can look like a blur. I remember watching Arthur Rubenstein play piano um, in a video, and it just, it's blurry. His fingers are blurry, but he's playing precise notes. <laughs> and so, you know, this was what I realized was happening was like, oh, wait, actually, no, I can hear them now. So interesting. I just, they're really, really fast. And so from that playing, um, I devised a process that I teach my clients to bridge the gap between how fast you can go and how fast you can perceive. So the first part is you do the thing with accuracy. <laughs> So you can go, yes, for sure, I know I'm singing the notes accurately, they're all in there. You want to pattern it in with accuracy. Somebody's unmuted and trying this. Love that. Sorry. <laughs> so you just make sure, like, okay, I can do the thing. Awesome. It's in there. So the first thing is, like, do I even know what I'm aiming for, right? If I'm doing archery, do I know where the target is? Do I know which little circle I want to hit? The second is to swing way in the other direction and sing it faster than you can control it. Ask for everything to be super loose and then let the pattern emerge on its own by fully letting go and by asking for that shape to emerge. <laughs> So you just get looser and looser until it feels like chaos, feels very wild. And then at some point your ears will go, no, no, there are notes in there. Yeah, that's really happening. So this is how I teach trills. This is how I teach ornamentation is like, okay, do you, can we do the thing at all with accuracy? Now we're going to see how do I get it to just be like a flutter, a thing that emerges. So that's my second example. So I'm going to end here by simply saying this. Creativity is not only our birthright, it is our design. It's inherent. And it matters greatly what you do, what we do with it, what we want to make. You know, I like to do this little double flutter thing in my Thracian phrases because it just fills me with joy. <laughs> and if I'm filled with joy, some of you are probably going to be into it. But at the very least, you're going to be connected with someone who is doing something joyful. And doing what we care about, the way that we are inspired to do it, really, really matters. It really is in our design. We are here to make the things we want to make. So I just want to say, from my perspective, please do that. Please make the things you want to make. I want to see them. Let's go to questions. 
Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is my idea of a good time. <laughs> it's just such an experience of grace being with you. Oh. Yay. Thanks so much um, for being part of this. Um, you, you had a question, Pamela, about Bulgarian saying. I do. I do, but I actually am curious to go to the question that you put into the chat first. Oh, I'm yes. Let's look at, okay. So what kind of, what kinds of training that you found in singing and performing are the least helpful? Yeah. Like name them? <laughs> no, no, no. Like, is there something like in general, I'm not, I'm not saying point fingers, but like, what things are you finding that's like the least against, the most against nature, the most oh. against what your design uh, is? Okay. This is interesting. I mean, cause I'm like, this could be a very long <laughs> I'm um, sure. Look, I'll give I'll give you kind of a I'll give you a way to figure it out for yourself. This is how I look at it, but this will be helpful in terms of like how do I decide if something is useful to me? One, if it's uncomfortable, yeah. it's wrong. And I don't mean uncomfortable like, oh, it's taking me to levels of of, you know, resonance that I've never had before and can I handle the truth or whatever? No, I'm saying like if it hurts your body, no, it's wrong. There is no singing that should hurt your body, even throat singing, even singing that's like, that's pretty rough. You can do it in a way that is the best it can get. So that's the first thing. These little tissues in here, they are very delicate. They're very resilient. They recover super quickly. Mm. And they're just like little tissues, you know? So we wanted to treat them well. Um, anything that hurts. Also, anything that restricts movement is just not going to work. We are animate, biological, biopsychosocial beings. So if it's about hold this and lift this and position this, it's not going to work because it's going to be putting structures on top of each other and then trying to make sure that it's a house of cards. So that leads me to my bigger point, which is a lot of arts training, performance training, is pre-19th century. It is pre-frickin' Cartesian. I had a client, or someone I've worked with a lot, uh, who's an actor, and she was telling me, you know, there's this known thing in, in theater, where it's like, you leave your shit at the door. You leave your shit at the door. That's how she put it. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Has anyone ever taught you a process how to do that? <laughs> and she was like, actually, no. <laughs> I'm like, right. So what we're doing is we're saying, we're saying you need to be able to do this, but we're not gonna tell you how, why? Cause we don't know, maybe because we don't actually care about teaching. I mean, you know, it's like what's happening there. So also it's not shit. It's who you are. <laughs> it's like, that's your emotional experiences. Is that, yes, it's, me it's mechanistic. And it is, again, it just is, it's Cartesian. And so what I always say, first and foremost, is whether you think you should or not, an artist must trust themselves. You need to trust yourself more than you trust anybody else because there will be coaches who have coached all of the amazing people and they'll tell you that you need to take your tongue and pull it really hard to stretch it or you need to tighten your abs or you need to pull, you know, all this stuff. One, goes against the laws of nature, goes against the design of our body, does not help with the actual art form. It's artifice, it's mechanistic and we're not machines. So we need to work in a way that is in cooperation with our biology, with our actual design. So if something ever makes you feel unwelcome, if something feels hard on your body, if something feels like they're telling me to do something, but they're not showing me how to do it, you know, this is like, we get into this when I coach clients of like, what are your actual consent cues in your body? because you need to know this. There are going to be things that come into your world that everybody thinks is amazing that are just not for you. They're just not gonna work for your process. So I would just say, the first thing is trust yourself. The things that are not effective are the things that are not bio-individual to you 
and in cooperation with the laws of nature. So for instance, one of the things that people talk about a lot with uh, singing and breathing and speaking, you know, professional air moving, is how, like, how you start your sound, your onset. Well, a lot of people have you bracing in your respiratory mechanism, which is the so sound making equivalent of the on ramps on the 110 uh, freeway in LA, right? You, you, <laughs> Lauren knows what I'm talking about. So if I breathe in and then I stop the flow of air and now I have to restart it, I've lost all of the flow and momentum that I created with my wind. So if you don't know, the 110 has these on-ramps that end in a stop sign, and then you're now having to go right into the flow of traffic of the freeway. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so muscular work is usually not the main thing, right? Yes. <laughs> well, yes, unfortunately, they just don't, they don't go 20 miles per hour. Or at least when I was there, they didn't. So is that helpful, Laura? Does that sort of answer your question? If it feels like Descartes' evil empire, run screaming. That's what I would say. <laughs> but there are a lot of traditions that... The other thing that I would say that's important about this is the way people describe things is not necessarily what they're actually doing. This is something I teach people who work with me is how do you actually look at and understand the quality of coordination because you will have somebody doing something and saying, yes, the way I'm doing it is this, and no, it's not what they're doing. Just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you can describe it. <laughs> and that has happened in so many fields. This was an old story with Andre Agassi, and he had a thing about how he did his swing. The way he described it was not what he was doing. People had all kinds of injuries, you know. So it really is like about orienting to truth for you and what will work for you. And having a coach or, you know, a teacher or whatever it is you're doing, our program, whatever, that is going to actually care about what works for you and is welcoming that, wants to know, right? And that doesn't mean that there aren't true things about optimal acoustics. But, you know, when I coach people, like, there are all kinds of things that come up. There's trauma, there's phobias. There's, you know, bad experiences. There's all kinds of stuff. My job is to co-regulate, right, and attune to who I'm dealing with. I'm not coaching an activity. I'm not coaching a sport. I'm coaching a human. And that first is all about our intimacy, our relationship, and me actually getting to care about them. <clears throat> I don't know where that soapbox came from. It just kind of rose up from the ground. Yeah, Pamela, I know, I know, I know, I know. Fuck, I know. There's a reason I'm not in academia anymore. It's not. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. The, the, uh, it's just not helpful. Yeah. You know? It's not, it's just not fucking helpful. Um, and at some point it was, very clear to me that to be able to do the work that I can do meant creating an entire new way of working and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, the institutions are like kind of hard to move, you know, they're unwieldy. They, they crystallize very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And as someone who is an artist, that's not really very in good cooperation with my design. <laughs> Other questions? What are the 17 languages? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, I have them written down somewhere. There might be more than 17 now, but, you know, it's like, I'm not going to, probably won't remember them all. Albanian, Bulgarian, Bosnian, Croatian. Uh, uh, there might be a D or any, what am I missing? D and E, I don't know. Um, French, German, Greek, Bulgarian. G H. Don't sing in Hungarian. Sing in Hebrew. Uh, H. Italian. Got a little bit in 
I've done a little bit of Balinese, but I should have put that under B. Um, I mean, it just goes on from there, you know. I mean, there's like the basic European ones, and then there's a lot of Balkan ones. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Yeah. I will do a reel on that one day. I really will. <laughs> you know, yeah. Whoa. Those are some of them. <laughs> and again, I'm not, I'm not someone who's looking for more stuff to do. It's just you hear the music and you're like, well, that's that. We're going to be doing that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, if it's calling to you, it's gonna. Yeah. <laughs> it's Just delicious. Like, okay. you can now I get to get to grips with that. All right, fine. I mean, I, right now I'm learning to read Greek. I mean, because I read um, Cyrillic. Hmm. Um, and so, and I put off reading Greek because I'm like, hey, I don't sing that much Greek music. Blah, blah, blah. Well, now I have an album coming out that's half Macedonian, half Greek. So I'm like, well, I need to get faster at just reading Greek and then I can sing all that stuff without having to think about it. You know, it's just that. <laughs> but I'm very lean in my process. I'm not, I'm not out here trying to learn every language just cause it's like right. very, you know, performance uh, based. Well, it's based on your desires of the moment. Yes. Yes. Which are massive often <laughs> and wildly specific. I have a question that's related to Laura's question, which is that when people come to you as trained singers or trained whatever, and they are they are very conditioned to operate in a way that is injurious to them and sort of away from the impulse of life. Hmm. Like someone who's really been through the hamster wheel of that and has that really deeply set. How, what do you do with those people? Well, a lot. I mean, the, the first thing I do is I go, okay, what, why are you here? What do you care about? Hmm. You know, what do you want? I, I, you know, what I always tell people is like, tell me what you want and then tell me the version of what you want that is the uh, magic wand version. The thing you won't even say because you think you can't have it. And that's usually what we're actually going to do. So, for instance, my client Raynell, she's like me we just have endless desires. Like we just really want what we want. So she'll come and be like, okay, so this is the aerialist uh, opera singer who goes all over the world singing Queen of the Night. So she came to me one coaching and she's like, I want to sound like a terrifying glockenspiel when I sing this, right? Like that's, it's, it's however it comes to you, that is what we're going to do. And then from there we get to go, okay, so what do you already have? that makes this possible. That's our opt optimal coordination. What do you need? And, and with optimal coordination, that's usually just a whole lot of really good news. Oh, did you know that your body's perfectly designed for that? <laughs> oh, did you know if you think this, you can actually, that other stuff, like you just don't even need to mess with it. So I call this going to an avail available pathway, right? You might have, like for me, when I retooled my singing, I had a lot of, um, neuromuscular patterns and associations around what singing was. And so I didn't call it singing for like a year. I called it making noise or phonating. And what I did was went, okay, if I didn't know all the fancy things I know and I were just experimenting with this rig, what, what actually is happening that I can understand, that I can play with? And I, I thought at some point I would reach a place where it was insufficient. Haven't hit it yet. <laughs> Always works better. So part of it is who are you really versus what are the layers of conditioning that have built up? And a lot of that has to do with just reckoning with and recognizing that was incorrect what you were told. That is not how I see it. That doesn't need to be the truth. What do you actually want? And if you're an artist and you make it into my world, it's, you're not, you're not kind of maybe an artist, like you're pretty fucking in, you know, I'm expensive. I am i I'm dropping shoes. I'm expensive. So if you end up in a conversation with me, you're committed to your artistry, whether you work with me or not, you're a very committed artist. And so you will have desires. They will have clear desires. My job is to both help them 
distill what's really them and what's conditioning. And this is a gentle process. It's not like I go in and, you know, start peeling stuff away. It's just, it, again, it's a process of emergence. So it's like, okay, well, what do you already do really brilliantly? Let's just shine that up and make sure that it's feeling really good for you. Then what skills might you need to be able to do what you want to do? Then, you know, I mean, God, for a lot of, for actors and um, singers especially, we're going to look at actual acting training, which very few of them have. Most of them are doing the best they can with what they've been told that they kind of already should be able to do. But that, that whole idea of like, okay, leave your shit at the door or, you know, be the character or whatever. It's like, there are, there are some really bonkers things that people are trying to do. And so what we do is we go, okay, how does it work really? What works for your system? What's reliable, right? And then we take that forth. So the other piece of it that I will say um, to answer your question, Pamela, is I also have advanced training in energy work, which was not something that I was uh, looking to do. I just got involved in it because it was so, 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 so effective. Um, and that does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. That does a lot of the heavy lifting, unwinding subconscious patterns, looking at what are the rules and beliefs that seem to be um, running the show that are actually just not correct, not appropriate, or not wanted? And how do we gently invite those to move out when they're ready so that we can just do what we want to do? Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, cool. <laughs> you can ask Molly. She'll be able to <laughs> probably tell you. <laughs> what we actually do yeah but thank you so much for doing this you are so welcome thank you so oh. much for giving me this opportunity this is the most delightful thing that you have all conceived and birthed and thank you for doing it and thank you for letting me par be part of it yay Yay! and if anybody has additional questions or you know, just wants to be in my world somehow, make sure you follow me on Instagram and you can reach out via email or whatever you want. Um, I really am kind of the fairy godmother of performing. So if there's something that you want that you're like, I don't know if I can have that, you might want to talk to me because you probably can. <laughs> <laughs> she can do it. Well, it's you fair. can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, is if there's no other questions, this was fabulous. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful Yay! Saturday. It was so great. Thank Yay. you. So Thank much. you. Loved it. Cool. Thank you.